This is part two of the Bitcoin fundamentals. You can find the link to part one in the video description. Our goal is to make corrupt data stick out like a popsicle in a desert and make it expensive to even try to corrupt the system. So here we have a transaction and it's disputed. John paid Anna $20, but there are disagreements around how much John actually paid Anna. And I'll introduce the idea of hashing that will uh, give light to how we might accomplish this goal. So in hashing, we have some data. It could be like this transaction, for instance. And you apply a hashing function to it. You can think about the hash hashing function as just like a way to scramble the data in some way that cannot be retraced to the original data. So this is transformed data, and you cannot get from the transformed data back to the data. It's like It looks like a bunch of gibberish to you. It's hard to reverse engineer how to get back to the original data. And the hashing function always produces the same output for the same input. But if you have some input that's... Uh, you know, slightly sim that's that's only slightly different than the other input. The output is still completely different. So, the output is uh, for for our purposes basically random. But for each input, the output is always the same, no matter how many times you run it through the. So, if you run the hashing function on that data once, same transform data. You run it again on the same data, same transform data, never changes. Okay. Uh, and one one easy example of some transformation, just to like give more clarity on what it does it mean to transform data, is if you have this alphabet um, and you're assigning a number to each letter, and then for instance, this is our data, the transaction, and you replace all the letters with the numbers, and you multiply it all together, you'll get some big number, and that number can be considered the transformed data. Except in this example, the it's, it's doable to convert the transformed data back into the original data, and you don't want that. So that's what hashing is. And what we want to do here involving hashing is we want to uh, impose some rules for the structure of transformed data. So if you have some transaction and you apply the hashing function to it, based on the structure of the transformed data, we can say, aha, that is not valid, that is valid. Um, and one way, you know, one example of the structure is let's say the transformed data must have five zeros at the end. But how, do, how does this work? So the data might be transaction data, so we don't want to arbitrarily change this. So if we have some data here, we put it through the hashing function, it doesn't have five zeros at the end what do you do? Um, the, do we just have data that is, that produces five zeros at the end, but we can't, we can't, so this is, makes very little sense if our data is fixed and, uh, we need five zeros at the end. So we have, um, what I, what I will call, a you know, test key or input. It could be called uh, a nonce in uh, the official jargon. And here is basically where you can, you know, put whatever you want with the data in order to get a transformed data that follows the structure. So in this, uh, in this setup, we have a rule now. When I uh, uh, apply a certain hashing function, the transformed data must have five zeros at the end. And you can have this test key slash input to you know, keep trying out different test keys until the transformed data has five zeros at the end. But this doesn't really solve our problem. If then anybody can just keep trying different test keys and eventually find a test key that produces a transformed data with five zeros at the end. How does this solve anything? The key thing here that has changed is that it actually costs something to um, have a valid transaction. And the cost is your computer spending a lot of uh, time, compute, to try different test keys um, in order to try to produce that uh, 
transform data of that form. So now that we have a cost associated with uh, valid transactions, the game has kind of changed. So these are a series of transactions or sets of transactions, and you can ignore the bottom text here for now. We have um, a set of transactions, and now that we know what it takes to create a valid transaction, let's say a malicious actor acts and edits this uh, data and um, corrupts the transaction. So let's mark it as corrupted transaction. And to make this valid, the attacker has to find a test key or nonce such that when hashed together by the hash function, it produces a transformed value that has the structure we want. In this example, five zeros at the end. So now we've introduced a cost to um, changing a transaction. And if this att attempt uh, doesn't work out, um, then the attacker has paid uh, some a financial equivalent uh, in, make, in trying out this attack. This is because compute takes electricity and the electricity costs money. So it, it uh, literally by the transitive property, it costs money to um, find the right test key. But that's still not robust enough. We don't want the attacker to just, uh, you know, spend money here and there and try attacking the network. It has to be overwhelmingly difficult to uh, corrupt the network. Something overwhelmingly difficult such that people are convinced that this network can be uh, relied on without needing to basically essentially trusting the network for its cryptography and for its algorithm. So now you can kind of take a look at this text. What would make this more robust is if we made it such that each following transaction depends, or set of transaction depends on the previous set of transactions, such that if one is corrupted, uh, not the attacker doesn't only have to find the test key for the corrupted transaction, but for everything onwards. So this makes it exponentially more difficult to corrupt a transaction, uh, more so as you go further back in time. So. Uh, this is kind of where the idea of you know, the, the central idea of the blockchain emerges. So this is like a chain of blocks that represent a transaction or a set of transactions. And let's start here. So we have the original data. We have we have to find the right test key such that the hash or transformed data produced is in the structure we want. In this case, five zeros at the end. Now for the next uh, set of transactions, instead of just using that as the input data with the test key, you also include the hash from the previous transaction as part of the input that also gets fed into the hash function. So uh, the a new transaction data, the hash from the previous transaction and uh, test key gets processed by the hash function to try to find a hash with the right uh, structure, which is five zeros at the end and so on. So you can see here, if this has been corrupted then the and then you need to find a new test key to produce the right structure for the hash. But even though this hash may have five zeros at the end, because you're using the inputs are different from before, this hash is a different hash. It's likely, to, it's very, very likely, almost certainly to be a different hash with five zeros at the end. So this affects the uh, hash of this set of transactions, and this hash likely won't have five zeros at the end anymore because the data has changed. So the attacker would find, have to find a new test key here as well. So in this sense, all of these blocks are um, invalidated and the attacker would have to uh, find new test keys for all of these. Let's say we have a chain of transactions and person A considers this to be the 
record. Person B considers this to be the record. And if person B with their squad tries to corrupt the chain, let's say they start here. Um, this is bad, evil uh, action. They'd have to find the new uh, test key for this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on. And if we make the heuristic of the network in determining what's the truth to be just the longest chain, here is how this becomes very, very difficult. So we have the, let's say we have the, the actually correct chain represented by A and all the good actors are contributing to A. So all the good actors are trying to find the test keys that build onto A and B and B's friends are trying to uh, produce a, a corrupt version. And to be clear here, if B successfully manages to extend longer than A, then this is considered truth, so B's chain. And then the all the actors, even the good actors, start building on top of this chain instead of the uh, previously considered good chain. Now the reason this is really tough is, uh, let me first cl uh, clear this up really quick. Um, Okay, is because the speed at which you're able to find the test keys is directly correlated to how much compute power you have. So the more compute power you have, the fast, the more opportunities you have to you know, try different test keys, validate blocks, add to the blocks. So uh, if B controls less than 50% of the world's compute power in this network, then they, B will find test keys slower than the chain in A. So let's say B figures out the test key for this, check, but in that time, this chain has already been extended by two because A is operating uh, fast, it has more compute, so it's fast, finding test keys faster. So now instead of needing to find the test keys for one, two, three, four, now uh, B has two additional ones to find the test keys for to become lo the longest chain. So let's say B finds the test key for this. Okay, that B has, but then uh, A finds two more. So now you can see the difference still continues to grow. So uh, in this scenario, it's very hard for B to become the longest chain unless it has um, greater than 50% of the compute power. And uh, that's really, really hard to get. Um, not impossible, but the key thing here is if B or if the, the person or group behind B decides to attempt this attack, it's extremely potentially expensive. So if B fails, uh, B probably has wasted a lot of money in the form of electricity. Um, so you know, there are, there are other things to consider, like, you know, uh, instead of like the, there's a myriad of things that are in the hacking world that can be, uh, potentially problematic, but we won't consider that here, but overall, um, even considering some edge cases, this seems like a robust system. It's very difficult for malicious actors to control that much compute and they're disincentivized to do so because of the cost associated with one attempt. So this idea of requiring some computational work and requiring proof of that computational work, this is known as proof of work. And uh, a lot of blockchain systems, including Bitcoin, are based on this notion. So going back to this uh, decentralized graph representing our network, we kind of have some of the answers to our previous questions when A sends uh, transaction or sends a payment to B, it broadcasts its transaction to everybody and everybody updates their records. And uh, in updating its records, uh, there's work that needs to be done in the form of finding that test key. And all the good actors 
they operate on the longest chain. They uh, work to find that uh, test key for the newest transaction. And if there are if there's a coordinated attack by malicious actors, uh, the malicious actors will have to find test keys faster than the rest of all the good actors, which is very unlikely. So that's how we establish this trustless record keeping system, this blockchain system that allows this financial system to uh, work without any central authority.